there's a lot of uh, a lot of folks who cite this as the aha moment, right? As that that eureka moment when it was suddenly realized, wait, the luminous ether can't possibly exist, and we moved on. Well, of course not. Hey, everybody. Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com, the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And today I thought we'd follow up on last week's Table Tuesday conversation, during which we talked about the possibility of there being an element zero, that there might be something on the periodic table even lighter than hydrogen. Now, we saw how Dmitry Mendeleev may have thought that this was so because of his choice of organization, where he placed the noble gases most specifically in the gap that that created to the left of hydrogen. But not to pick on Mendeleev, there was one other place on the table where Dmitry Mendeleev tried to place what he thought would be a yet-to-be-discovered element that, in, in fact, turned out to not exist at all. And that's not a, a position that we would call maybe element zero, but rather in an entire new row of the periodic table above hydrogen, a row zero, if you will. So why would he want to do that? Well, we have to think back pretty far to get some perspective on this conversation. You see, the ancient Greeks actually believed that there was an element called the ether. It was a, a, a fine substance that supported the firmaments. It held the stars in place. It was this very mystical, sort of romantic type of substance. Um, and that idea persisted for quite some time until it started to become clear that none of the elements the Greeks were proposing were, in fact, elements. So in the 16 and 1700s, the ether began to get a bit of an overhaul. It got a, it got a facelift, if you will. And it became what was called the luminiferous ether. The luminiferous ether is supposed to be, or was theorized to be, this substance that is of extremely fine particle size, but it was the medium through which light propagated. Right? Just like you, you can't have a water wave without water, it was thought you can't have a light wave travel without the luminiferous ether there to propagate it. And so uh, if the luminiferous ether existed, it had to have been made of something, and if it had to have been made of something, it must have had a home on the periodic table. And so Dmitry Mendeleev in 1871 scribbled some handwritten notes in the top left corner of one of his own periodic tables. And this note essentially indicates the ether is a million times lighter than the other elements. And so he had made a note there to hold a place in that top corner of the table for when he finally was able to, or humanity was finally able to discover the luminiferous ether. Hmm. So if you've uh, taken a science course, particularly one in chemistry or physics, you're probably familiar with the Michelson-Morley experiment and how in 1887, data were collected that effectively disproved the existence of the luminiferous ether. And so I've gone ahead and pulled that paper up so we can take a look at it. And the apparatus that they designed uh, was really quite remarkable. Uh, it was a very large uh, brick supporting structure that had a huge turntable atop it with a table on that turntable that had mirrors mounted at the corners. And the mirrors were there to reflect a beam of light that had been split in two different directions. And of course, the idea here was, if light is traveling in, uh, to orthogonal directions, and they're traveling through a medium that is itself moving relative to the instrument, that we should see some kind of interference pattern evolve when those beams came back together after being reflected. And so they built this contraption right here. Uh, it's about a meter wide. And believe it or not, that giant table there is floating on a pool of mercury, liquid mercury. That allowed them to rotate this and sample this experiment over and over again at various angles uh, as, as they went about their, their experiment. Furthermore, Michelson and Morley collected data both at noon and at 6 p.m. Uh, over the course of several days, assuring that the Earth would have rotated one quarter turn in between experiments. And so any discrepancies that, that may have arisen because of their relative position and the rotation of the Earth hopefully would be noticeable. Now, the results that they uh, obtained, of course, are nothing short of historic. They didn't see any interference pattern. No matter what they did, no matter what time of day it was, no matter what angle they pointed their device, those light beams came back and met one another perfectly in phase. So that's it, right? The luminiferous ether was doomed. Well, maybe it was doomed. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of folks who cite this as the aha moment, right? As that, that eureka moment when it was suddenly realized, wait, the luminiferous ether can't possibly exist, and we moved on. Well, of course not. That's not what science is about. Science is about making an observation, formulating a new hypothesis, 
and then proceeding to test that new hypothesis until we're out of ideas. And if we look to the end of the Michelson-Morley paper, what, we'll no what we notice is that they actually tried to make some, some hypotheses that would still allow for the existence of the luminiferous ether. Right? Was there any other possible explanation for what they saw besides there is no luminiferous ether? I want to read just a few very, very short passages here for you. Uh, it appears from all that proceeds reasonably certain that if there be any relative motion between the earth and the luminiferous ether, it must be small, quite small. So what he's saying here is the earth and the luminiferous ether, if it exists, are moving in essentially the same direction at the same speed because we can't detect any motion through that ether. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That just is very unlikely, right, that we're moving at exactly the same rate in exactly the same direction as the luminiferous ether is. Um, and then another theory that he came up with, well, what if the luminiferous ether is like an atmosphere around the earth? meaning that um, the luminiferous ether down here around sea level is being dragged along with the planet, just like our gaseous atmosphere is, meaning that, of course, we're not going to see any effect here because the luminiferous ether that's just hanging out here right at the bottom surface of the earth is moving with the earth. Well, we'll never notice the difference. So what does he propose to do? He proposes to run the experiment on the top of a mountain to try to get as far up as possible near that ether that may not be getting dragged along with the earth. Now, of course, both of these hypotheses are falsifiable and ultimately were falsified. However, remember, this was 1887. And yet Dmitry Mendeleev published a table in the first decade of the 1900s that contained a row zero and a place for an element that he called Newtonium in this version of the table. And that element is the same as the luminiferous ether. This is where Mendeleev thought it should be. And so here we were a solid 15 years or so after uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment, and still some of the greatest minds in chemistry firmly believed that the luminiferous ether was going to be discovered one day. But all that came crashing down shortly after. Essentially, what happened was, of course, the great Albert Einstein came along and showed us that within any internal frame of reference, light travels at the same speed, and that is, a, that is an absolute fixed law of the universe. Therefore, there can be no medium that transmits the light. So today we know that the luminiferous ether does not exist and that there really is no row zero on the periodic table. But for quite some time, it was thought that there very well might be. Well, that's all for today, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'm Professor Davis from chemsurvival.com, YouTube channel Chemsurvival. See you next time.